Hey, today we're picking up again with site design. Last time we talked a lot about parking, and today we're going to do a little more talking about parking and then move into entrances coming off of streets going up to your building and your site and typically entering the parking lot through there. And that's one of the more critical pieces that we need to design well. I mean, parking lots are important, but getting people on and off the street safely is important. And a lot of jurisdictions that you're going to work with, the state and cities and counties, they look very closely at your, your parking lot entrances and exits and make sure that you've done them well. And they often have standards they want you to follow and or um, things they will or won't approve uh, when they see your, your plans. And so it's a, something to keep in mind as we get into this more. So our objective today is again, talk about parking uh, space size requirements and layouts and different uh, site entrances that we can look at uh, from there too. I guess to get started with this, I normally ask this in class, um, how many have you used Uber, Lyft, or DD you know, in the last year? I'm guessing probably a fair number of you. Uh, it's fairly common, uh, right, to, to use these services. Maybe not so much in Valparaiso, maybe, well, maybe a little bit in there. But when I go to Chicago, I almost always get a Lyft car now uh, in there if I need something. Uh, you know, train brings you into Millennial Station. If I'm headed off to the hotel, then after that, we'll usually get a lift car. And if we have luggage, if it's just me, I'll just walk uh, through there. Or if we're going to go somewhere, we were up there at Christmas, so we went to see the lights up at uh, Lincoln Park Zoo. So we took a lift up there and then back and then downtown through there. I didn't want to walk that far. So uh, being an out-of-towner and being in a city I'm, I'm not familiar with, I'll often use one of these services when I lived in China for the summer. I use DD all the time uh, to get around uh, and go places uh, through that. Uh, when I visit DC and so forth for conferences, uh, I'll take Lyft there as well uh, for that. So I think that's a fairly common uh, standard. Some people use it every day. Some people actually are using it for commuting now, right? That's a little different. And I guess that's the next question is why, <laughs> why are we using it? What's, what was the purpose of your trips? Why did you use those services? So this was a, a news item that came up uh, last year in the spring about Uber and Lyft and how they're affecting parking demand and ties right into what we're talking about today, right? We're talking about how many spaces you need in your parking lot, which cities regulate. Cities will require you to have so many parking spaces available uh, because in, when cars really took off in the U.S. after World War II, when they had all the manufacturing capacity, the... You know, think about what the U.S. looked like just after World War II. It was still very traditional, uh, traditional-looking downtowns and streets. It's like downtown Valparaiso, right? And and even more traditional than it was then. It was probably busier. It had more buildings and so forth. But not many people had cars, and so in, in those days, you there wasn't that much parking available. And as cars took off in the 50s and into the 60s, there was just a mass uh, problem in these these urban environments where there wasn't enough parking. And in kind of reflexively, I guess, uh, the agencies jumped in and demanded that you have enough parking so that people could easily drive and that there isn't a shortage of parking and people aren't parked illegally and there isn't a crunch and people who own stores liked it because now you know, their customers can get to them because they're all driving now coming in used to be we had street cars and buses and, and services like that even in smaller towns like valpo we would have uh, in the 30s 20s and 30s we had a pretty good public transit system because of what people relied on then and that all kind of went away once the individual driver uh, model uh, took over now maybe it's coming back so that's the that's what we look at a lot especially in urban more denser urban environments people are getting away from wanting cars uh, in the 60s and 70s everybody's moving to the suburbs and wanting to drive into town uh, for the convenience of it and you could get a bigger house if you lived out in the suburbs and that's that's reversed now right uh, and the uh, residential areas near the loop have actually really taken off over the last 15 years and people want to live back downtown even indianapolis has seen a resurgence and people wanting to live close to downtown and have all those, uh, the, the benefits of all the pluses of being near an urban center. That's how they see it. So that's, that's changed a lot. 
And so th these people did a, a study on how Uber and Lyft were, are affecting this need for parking. And so just think about it, you know, the reason we have those rules we talked about last time about how much parking you need near for your business based on square footage is really a kind of reflective action from the, the cities about, well, we don't want you to run out of parking because then it becomes our problem. People are, are out on the street and there's this mass chaos and, and so forth. And that's why they have all these, these rules like we did in the last ICA about how many parking spaces you need uh, for each one. Well, if we're changing the model of how people move, do we... Do we need to look at that again? Do we need to re-examine these parking requirements? And a lot of, uh, like this group calls themselves the new urbanists, a lot of these new urbanists uh, are looking at that. So here's one study. Streets blog is all about new urbanism. <laughs> All right, and coming back, which is basically um, going back to the traditional model from the turn of the century, the turn of the last century, the early 1900s, and that the way the streets were laid out in the grid pattern, um, fairly tighter, smaller lots and all that, sidewalks, it's really conducive to, to a better uh, holistic environment um, that's not just car-centric. Right. So you could, if you think about between the campus and downtown Valpo, any of those those uh, neighborhoods in there, it's pretty easy to get around, right? You could easily walk either downtown or to Valpo in probably 15 minutes, right? You could get on the campus or less. It used to be considered that if you could, within 20 to 30 minute walk, would would be a reasonable walk that you could expect people to do. And I don't, I don't think that's true anymore. But that's what before the before World War II, that's what, that was considered it. Is that about 20 minutes was considered um, perfectly fine, and it was only uh, more than a 20 minute walk that uh, people would consider taking the streetcars, you know, and, and use transit uh, to get to where they needed to go. And so that they would actually, you know, there's uh, planning studies that show that that traditional cities and towns were kind of based on there'd be a shopping area within 20 minutes of any residential uh, district and if it was further than that a new shopping district would pop up and you can see this in some older towns there's these little corner mom and pop stores and sometimes uh, adjacent two adjacent corners there's a restaurant and the mom and pop store and the bar all on you know three corners of this one intersection in the middle of what's otherwise just all residential right so uh, south bend and mishawaka are very much this way in fact mishawaka still has a lot of neighborhood bars and kind of known for it uh, milwaukee i think is the same story there the and that says just how these were built and um Nobody wanted to go more than 20 minutes, and so you'd have these these small, like, convenience store uh, ideas pop up. And But they were walk-up. They, they didn't have parking or drive-up windows or anything like that. Right, excuse that. So that's that's what we're coming kind of back to, uh, and that's what the new urbanists like to look at is if we designed, uh, if we don't build these expansive subdivisions with lots of cul-de-sacs, everybody could get around a lot easier and it's more likely you're going to walk or ride your bike if you felt it was safer. The way we designed subdivisions in the 60s and 70s was very not conducive to walking or biking, right? Um, and it's well, there's a lot of reasons, but we won't go into it now, right? I've already burned enough time. So let's move on. Um, so this study, it was saying that, well, if Uber... If we check out why people are using Uber and Lyft, maybe we can reconsider how much parking we need downtown because parking downtown is eating up valuable real estate. And because we have so much parking downtown, then less can happen there, right? We don't have as, as much shopping. We don't have as much place for shopping. We don't have as much residential. It's less of a vibrant community. And if we want downtowns to be alive after 5 p.m. when everybody at work goes home we need to make them more vibrant we need to connect all these things into it and if we didn't have so much space being used for parking we can uh, free up a lot more space for other things that people would want right um, you maybe want to live near downtown but there's no shopping nearby then it becomes very difficult right you'd if you're going to live downtown, you want to have shopping nearby. You want to have some stores that you can go to uh, through that. So that's that's kind of where they're coming from, I think, in a study and looking at it. And what they found is, um, is that because it's in the U.S., right, 72% of the time when people were riding Uber and Lyft, there was no cost for parking, but people were still riding Uber and Lyft anyway um, for that. Or it really didn't take long at all 
for you to find a parking space. So the lack of parking wasn't always a big issue right, for that. And it's just because, especially our, our smaller urban areas, smaller towns, I mean, think about Valpo. I mean, there's always free parking somewhere nearby. And, okay, maybe right downtown, if you're trying to go to, to um, uh, BW's, there may not be parking right in front of it, but they've got a lot out back, right? Almost all the stores do. Or maybe one block away, you've got parking. Right? You're never going to be that hard to find parking in a town like Valpo. Yeah, so that's, you know, 72% of the time, you can it's right there, and it takes 30 seconds or less to find uh, to uh, look for it, right, for that. But, I mean, in worst case, they found it was, you know, 3.4 minutes before they found um, uh, parking. And the worst places are concert venues. So a lot of people are coming in there and all right, look for it. Airports and college campuses. Well, okay, not so much Valpo. <laughs> we have such an easy way to park here. I mean, everybody can find a spot. And we still complain about it. Um, but it's really easy to find parking at Valpo versus you know, uh, larger universities where you have to park a mile away and walk in all right, through that. So those were the, the places they found the, the biggest uh, issue, right, for that. And um, what they found, like in Des Moines, which is a classic uh, Midwestern sprawl kind of city who really embraced cars and wanted to not have trouble with parking and required lots of parking spaces, just like people in Indiana do in most cities. In Indiana, they find that in Des Moines, the study they did, there's 18 parking spaces for every person in that city, right? So, you know, not maybe exactly where you want them to be, but there are so many parking spaces because every building you built, right, just like that sheet we had last time, every one of those had to have so many spaces. Well, there's 18 spots for every person in that, in Des Moines, right? So there's a lot of them not being used at any one time, right? So the, um, and talking to uh, Uber and Lyft and tracking these, these drivers or the passengers, what they found is that the number one reason people rode Uber and Lyft was to drink, right? And maybe that's when you use it in Valpo is if you're going to the bar and you don't, or maybe it's more you're coming home from the bar, but either way, you don't want to drive. Um, and it's also a reason people used to take taxis, right? If you intended to drink responsibly, then you would get a ride share home, right? Through that. Parking was the second most, uh, common reason and that's exactly when i go to chicago i don't want to i don't want the hassle and the cost of parking right it's like you go to the hotel it's 40 bucks a night to have your car parked there right it's almost as much as a room but um so i'd rather ride the train and then i get a lift over to the hotel you know from there so that's exactly uh, one of the reasons why i use uh, ride share when i go to a, a larger urban environment i don't want to deal with the parking i don't want to do, I should deal with the hassle and the cost you know both of those things uh, are on there right um and then some people will say because they didn't have public transit, they could take them where they wanted uh, to go to. So just think that um, I think their their point here is with rideshare taking off. Uh, well, it was maybe not right this month, um, but had been taking off more and more uh, over the last uh, you know, seven, eight years. We can maybe reevaluate how much parking we require uh, for each business. And if you, people are going to be using rideshare to get places, then we can maybe cut down on the number of parking spaces for that. All right. And this is what we looked at. This was one from uh, Valpo. We did a parking study for the campus. Um, actually, the last two years, this was the one from two years ago, the original one, which we did a, a lot of studies and looked at you know, which, which parking lots uh, were the busiest. And you can see over here on the right, this, that's the commuter lot. Uh, back in the little time lapse, and that was before the, they added extra commuter spaces, but uh, kind of use this to see an overall usage, right? So by four o'clock, you know, sixteen hundred hours, we're starting to lose everybody out there. So it's a very, it's a, and you can see these little graphs over here in these corners. It's there's obviously very high peaks at certain times and not at others, right? And then you can expect that. And if you're a commuter student, you know that right offhand, right? Uh, that there are certain times of day it's bad uh, to get through there. All right. This is what we looked at last time is how to lay out uh, parking lots. And this is a guideline, uh, guidelines for making sure you've got enough width in between your stalls, how, how wide the stalls should be, what the angle uh, can be, and how that relates to the width in the aisle and the, the total bay width as you go through that. And whether you want angled or straight in and one way or two way 
parking. Those are all options. And we went through those last time. We also talked about when you're laying out these parking bays, uh, coming up to the end, we don't like to let people park right at the end. We like to uh, either landscape those or cross hatch them off with striping to not allow parking so that you can see and you can uh, pull out into the circulating uh, lanes here easily on either side. And so that's kind of where we left off last time last time i just wanted to pick up from there so that's the primer for where we were where we're going today is is the entrance coming in off of the public street into your parking lot and into your site i guess it's not always directly into a parking lot but into your site uh, how do we design that entrance and the things we want to remember are how can we get smooth flow and that's very important and we like smooth flow for a lot of reasons one it's safer and um two it um it reduces the frustration of any patron, right? And most of these sites, it's probably commercial and you don't want people to not come to your place because it's so hard to get to or get in or out of, right? And people feel that way. They're like, oh, I'm going to avoid that until the last, you know, unless there's no place else to go, then uh, then I'll go there. And you can probably think of a few stores and, and places where the road is so bad, so busy of traffic, it's so hard to get in or out of, that you would avoid a place. Uh, and maybe you would go there more often if it was easier to get to. So smooth flow is is good for that. It's also, um, you want drivers to uh, understand what's going on quickly and make it easy for them, which improves flow and improves safety. All right. And then the, a big thing, which is what all the jurisdictions who give you permission to have a driveway and an entrance into your parking lot are going to look at is they don't want you to impact the public street. And so people shouldn't be slowing down excessively out in the public street or particularly backing up, waiting to turn in and impacting the through movement of, of traffic. That'll get you in big trouble fast with a city. Right? If, the, if people are waiting out on the street to turn in and everybody else has to wait behind them, uh, if it happens a lot, they're going to be talking to you about how to improve that, right? And so that's a big issue with a lot of cities. And it's they're probably their number one factor when it comes to uh, proving new uh, new entrances, new driveways, right? So this is a public street out here. We say a major arterial. It's signalized. And here is kind of an older style, I would say. You know, parking lot, it just... Uh, minimal entrance and then it just dumps everybody out and it's like a free-for-all in here and this is how they used to do these in some of these bigger shopping centers before they uh, well what taught us all to do it better was the failures <laughs> so we had enough failures in th these kinds of intersections these kinds of entrances um, that people got better at it and so this is not a good a good one right so you've got very little storage length here you got one car that can wait Right, that's an important thing to remember. You can only, uh, we want to have more stacking, more storage for vehicles in here than just one vehicle, right? And if someone else tried to wait here, now you're cutting off circulating flow, right? That's terrible, right? People coming in, it's not well delineated. Um, this is all a big, wide open area. Is that one lane? Is that two lanes? That confusion is going to hurt your flow and can lead to more accidents, right? And we talked about channelization a couple of weeks ago. And some of the reasons for channelization is it improves flow and improves safety and it helps people know where they're supposed to be. Right, there's one little island in here, but this is such a wide open thing. You know, you'd need extra striping, you need uh, a little better channelization if you were going to use that and keep this moving uh, through there. And and then once you're in, you're kind of you're not lined up with any of these aisles, and you're you, so you're going to have to turn as soon as you're in one direction or the other. You're also not lined up to come out, and so everyone's going to be trying to turn. Who was there first? And shopping centers are terrible about not putting up, you know, really any any internal signs. You know, do you stop here, and do the people coming in have free flow, or is it like a four way stop here? You know, what is it? Uh, so these are all. Uh, issues that you should think about when you're looking at it, right? This is not a good design, and I think you can see right off why. Well, yeah, it's probably not a good design. And we're going to show some pictures here and, and look at better things, you know, as we're going through it. All right, this is a, a very new development. This is 10 years old or so. This is out there at the Meyer. The Meyer has been built now. They held off. Um, this is State Road 2 just east of 49, 49's right over here, and Valpo's there, right? And the theaters are back here, and Meyer gas station's here now, and then Meyer store is right up there. Here's Dick's Sporting Goods. Right? So 
And this one, you may not have thought of it before, but you know, okay, it's a pretty boulevard style entrance, which means he's got trees and a median down the center. It's got two lanes of entry because there's two left turn lanes. So both of those left turn lanes can move at the same time. So we have some channelization, great. Coming out, we also have channelization and we have a left, a through and a right turn lane. So we've got all the lanes we need. It should be fairly clear which direction you're going, which lane you need to be in. Awesome. Those are good things. Look how long this is, right? And they made it even longer by putting this little S-curve in there, right? That adds distance uh, along the center line of your road, right? Like that. So that's uh, that's a good thing. And uh, instead of this stubby little entrance here like this, right, which is not good at all, um, in a nice long one like that, you've got tons of storage space because up here is a four-way stop. Well, uh, what happens is if this gets backed up right here at this entrance, it backs up out onto the street really bad. And that will cause uh, very dangerous accidents because people coming down here may not realize these people are stopped and run into the back of them. So it's a, it's a traffic flow problem. It's a safety. It's a big safety problem. And that's, that, like I say, really will get the city mad at you if you're backing cars up out onto their street. Meyer did, and probably because the city made them, um, have this really nice long entrance road. Okay, there's one entrance here into Dix, but only an exit. You can't turn left back out of Dix. So this median is cutting off anybody turning left out of here, which really improves this flow coming through here and keeps people from trying to cross and then not being able to them blocking traffic, right? With this much length, um, you can move a lot of cars out of here and into this entrance road and stop up here, right? Um, it's probably never going to spill back out on the state road too. Not unless this thing really, really gets a lot busier than I've ever seen it, right? Maybe you're spilling back about this far, but you should never be back the state road too. That is a lot of storage length, two lanes wide, right? Remember. So this is a really good design and that's, um, it's enforced by these cities to, and this was a state highway, but this is inside the city jurisdiction. So between the two of them, they probably really forced this on the developer. That's expensive, right? To force it on this developer that there is very little chance you're ever going to back cars up out into this, uh, on the state road too, which is what exactly what nobody wants. Right through that. So this is an example of a pretty good design. Through that, the center median right here, that that's a, a divisional you know, island, right, for our channelization, and that's keeping anybody from turning left coming out of Dix here. You have to go out this road, which is fine. Okay, if you cause a traffic problem back here, the city don't care, right? <laughs> if you cause a traffic problem over here, the city and the state care, and they are coming after you as a developer, and you will not get peace until you fix it. Um, through that. Here's an example. This is Walmart in Goshen, and I used to go by this one. That's why I'm using this example, because um, I'm familiar enough with it to know it had problems, right? So here's here's their entrance road, right? And here's their parking lot, and they added some more parking here, and you can see. And it's this is a really busy Walmart. It doesn't look like it in this picture. I don't know what day they flew over, but it must have been early in the morning on a weekend, maybe. I don't know. Um, anytime I drove by there in the evenings, you know, this, this parking lot is packed out here. And it looked okay. They've got a nice, you know, decently long... Uh, storage area, right? Throat back in here. You can see how that goes. And then it ties into the rest of the parking lot. And you can almost see where, where these tire marks are, where it's darker. You can see how people are flowing around from this outside edge, this perimeter, and coming back through there. All right, here's that turning radius. So people are using this as the circulatory road out here, but they kind of have to because it doesn't cut through the parking lot there. And these are one way, one directional parking bays. So they were trying to squeeze in even more parking spaces as they could through here. Well, I can tell you from exam, um, from experience, and this comes in, this, this goes straight up to the front doors of Walmart, right? This thing gets a mess, uh, through there and this will back up. This is a stoplight. This is a really busy road. There's probably not enough green time because there's just not enough. It's over capacity at this intersection. This thing will back up easily in, in the afternoons. And I've been here trying to get out and there's cars like two deep over here and three or four deep over here. And then you don't know who has the, the next right of way. Then the light turns green. Then everyone tries to jump in that line real fast to get out uh, for there. Because uh, if you're turning left, it's really the only chance you've got uh, to get out of this place. 
and it's it's just a mess. And you would think, okay, well, that's enough. I mean, that's decent. I mean, how many cars do you think you can park in there? Probably 10, 10 or 12. It's not enough, right? Look at this thing, right? 10 or 12 cars would put you back about here, right? They've got way more on that. And that's good because this one didn't work. This one does not work at all, right? Um, this really backs up and is a mess. So even though it looks like, you know, okay, they tried, uh, it's just not enough. The the peak demand in this place is just way outstrips that, right? So that's that's another example. This is the not good example, right? Here's one back for, in over here in Valpo. This is over at the Applebee's on US 30, right? Look at this. You know, we got maybe one or two cars we can get in here, but you're immediately right into this, this uh, circulatory uh, road piece, right? And then you've got people coming in from here and then maybe someone's coming out here and they're going to try to turn back left immediately and then people are coming here, right? That's back to that original example. That looks like this one. That is straight up what this is, right? And it's a mess and it's bad. And the only thing that saves this one probably is because um, these two, or I guess there's three businesses, maybe they don't have that much traffic all at once, you better hope they don't, right? I don't know. A jewelry store, I can't imagine there's a lot of peak traffic coming out of there. Applebee's, yeah, could be. Could be, especially around lunchtime or something. Um, I haven't been to this during lunch. My guess is it can get a, to be a problem. Right, see you there. Not a good design. That's that's very common along US 30. Um, I think the city's been trying to fix it by putting more frontage roads. But it used to be everybody just threw up a, a restaurant and popped in a driveway and there wasn't any real design uh for traffic out there right it, back in the 60s and 70s when 30 was getting built you know oh it's great new new road i'm gonna put my restaurant out here and then i'm gonna screw up all the traffic but um retrofitting the things is a lot more expensive well now this this building's too close to the road you know your setbacks aren't big enough to really scoot things back they're too close to each other and and where this access of this public access is right lots of trouble which you as a future site designer will avoid because you know better and you'll design your road with a lot of nice storage in here very nicely channelized uh, so that there's not this mass confusion and potential problems right for that here's some of the tools in your toolbox as a designer and we like to use these this is a right in right out we call it and so here's your right turn going right in whoops and here's your right back out and this would be a yield uh, point sometimes a stop but it's usually a yield and then you can come back out right you can't turn left that saves a lot of conflict and a lot of time um, in disturbance in general, especially the through movement of traffic. But also, if there's if you only got a single lane coming out of here and someone's waiting to turn left, you can back things up for minutes um, until that person gets a gap and finally moves. And then there's like five people behind them all wanting to turn right. Could have gone ahead if that one person who wanted to turn left wasn't trying to turn left. Right, Left turns are always a problem. So that's one way to restrict it. You can also have a, a straight right in only and no way back out All right this is over at the mall in Merrillville. this is right off of i-65 is right here here's mississippi street there is this dedicated right turn uh, right uh, in only and it's it's not common here's Coles right there um so if you're coming off the interstate and you want to go to Coles, this is great this is like the entrance of the bat cave man it's a little secret entrance here Shroom, you're right in you can jump into Coles, especially if you're a handicap oh, right there's your handicap spot you get a little zebra crossing bam you're in Coles. um i don't see these very often this is a, a an odd uh, location quite often as a former a government worker we would allow an agent or a, a developer to do this if they used to have a full driveway access and once it's granted it's really hard to give that or take that back from people but you can twist their arm really hard to convert it into a right in right out or in this case a right in only could have been that's what this this was that before things got uh, really busy over in Merrillville and it became such a shopping center area that they might have had just a normal driveway that went with this lot with this parcel and over time when this got all built up in the malls right behind Coles here um, 
that you know this is a terrible place to, to try to come out here and turn left because in a normal day again this must be like sunday morning oh well this is this is one direction only out here right there's no way you can turn back left out of here but people would try <laughs> if you let them they will try right so if you you can come in this way, there's an exit over here on the mississippi or you can go out at one of the stoplights over here on us 30. so that's a ride in only um they work really well um the nice thing about it is unlikely to back up because you've got a single direction of cars coming in and uh, all of most of their deceleration this is a turn lane anyway most of their deceleration is out of the through lanes so this is a pretty good thing that's not going to affect this traffic this through traffic much at all so nice nice uh, nice option for there right this is a, a left and right in right out only and these are odder i've seen these in in person um not so much in indiana but yeah, you have to have more median space out here and you need some channelization to keep people. Otherwise, people really will. If you just stripe this, everyone's going to turn left out of here. You can't stop them. It just uh, don't even try. Um, so you're going to have to have curb and gutter out here and your channelization. So islands, right? And another great use of our islands, right? So you can turn right. You can slow down, turn right and pull in here. You can turn left, but you can't make this exiting left. And that's what we're restricting. And that is a good thing to restrict. Those, again, that left turn coming out of a driveway, you're crossing one lane of traffic and entering another one. Quite often there's multiple lanes here. That is not good, right? That is, it's unsafe, especially in a busy commercial area. There's too much to try to watch all at once. Someone's waiting over here to turn left. You're still, you're going to try to come out of here and turn left. Uh, not good, all right? So that's a good reason to restrict that. And here's a here's a good example. The Mishawaka's got uh, right along Main Street. They've got like three or four of these in a row. And so Mishawaka were big believers in this. Again, they learned um, from the mistakes of the past. <laughs> That's probably learned most things, right? The, they just used to be have left turns allowed out of here, and it was a nightmare and, and lots of wrecks. And, and this is all backed up, all right? So this is the Culvers and got good ice cream there, of course. Um, it's got this this left. Uh, left in, right in, and right out. Right? You can't turn left back out of here. You can come out here to this service road and come out here and come back up, and that is the best way to go, and it's really nice to have this, this exit road because now you can turn right, come up to the light, now it's safe to turn whichever direction you want from here. So if you were going to head back south, yeah, you're right, you're right on it. You can see here if you're going southbound on Main and you want to turn left, there's your left lane, and you can come in here, here's Culver's, and if you're Trying to turn out, nope, can't do it. This is all curved. There's nice, pretty landscaping. Mishawaka did a nice job of all this landscaping here. Uh, this is kind of the uh, ritzy section of shopping in that area, through the regional shopping area. But you can turn back right out of here. There's also a little frontage road here. It goes, I think there's a Giro place and a Gordon's food store over here. So, you know, there's the Arby's. Um, so you've got all these options, you know, along there. So that's, that's a... An interesting one, uh, like they, that's not used very often, but it does work really well. That left turn out of here, you're crossing two lanes northbound plus merging with two lanes southbound. Really dangerous maneuver to do. This road gets really busy. It's often back to here. You know, you've got cars backed up. Um, and so any of these driveways in here is going to be very problematic trying to get out uh, through that. And then the, the other one, I may have used this example before. This is the University Park Mall again in Mishawaka. This is just north of, and a little bit to the west of what we were just looking at. University of uh, Notre Dame is over here. Um, and this is University Park Mall, which is just a big mall, which, like most malls these days, isn't doing as well as it used to do. But this was the hot place to be. Still kind of is, not as much as it was, but it's still, uh, I guess... Amazon's the hot place to be now for shopping. Um, but the mall is still really busy, and especially around Christmas, as you can imagine, and weekends. For that, here's their main entrance. Their main entrance comes off University Drive at Grape and comes in here. And this has been redesigned. I think this is on its third iteration. They built the mall in the 70s. Um, so, what, 45 years later, I think they've redone that entrance road well the original design and like twice since then they've redesigned it the last time was 15 years ago more or less like that so here's their here's a redesign you know, uh, thanks google earth here's their entrance road this is their exit here's their entrance road coming in right they they s-curved it 
They tried to S curve it to gain storage space. And they come in here and then we've got a three way stop. And here's the exit. And here's a crosswalk right in the middle of that. And no one uses this sidewalk. Everyone's walking along here. Um, and then over here is another raised sidewalk. This is going into the food court area, kind of. And there's a bookstore right there. Um, a lot of people park as soon as they can. Let me back up one, which is going to be right in here. All right, all right, here's the food court. But right in here is, this is the Barnes & Noble, which is a popular entrance, and in, straight into the heart of the mall. A lot of people like to park right there, and then they're going to cut across right on these crosswalks. It really backs up traffic, and I've seen it backed up. People waiting on people, pedestrians, backed up in this intersection, and that's a mess. Right. And like uh, some shopping areas, the inbound doesn't have a stop sign, and it, it's free flow, and then only the two side roads have stops. It... Um, at the mall, it's a three-way stop. So on the inbound, you have to stop if you're going to turn left. These people have equal priority as, as the inbound, and so do these. And it's a mess. And this this thing will back up um, every cycle. Every signal cycle, it backs up out into the intersection on those busy shopping days. Right? It is nowhere near adequate. I mean, look at all the parking. <laughs> and it's, yeah, there's more entrances, right? And if you're, you know, if you're smart, you don't go in this entrance because you know it's it's a disaster, right? You you buzz through here northbound and come in this one. Um, although this is J.C. Penney and I think they're going out of business, right? So, but uh, this is a disaster. This one, this entrance is a disaster. The city hates it. They didn't. The city's mad at them because they didn't get it consulted much when they redesigned it the last time. Um, so it, it goes on. Here's a little video. It, uh, the link in your notes is, is going to work better than, uh, than this link I've got here. I'll just bring this little sucker over here. It's going to look jittery on this screen, but we're going to give it a shot. Let's see if my internet's fast enough to even show it. Maybe not. So I took a video. Yeah, here it is. So here's that mall out here. It's going to look jittery on your screen. Again, you can follow the link in the notes and see a much smoother video of it. Or here's that intersection. This is Grape Road out here. And we were doing a traffic study out here. So we've got, uh, these are the markers for what the traffic signal is doing. I may have showed you this in 252. But right, here's this S-curve road. You can see back here. See where these cars are going. Okay, it looks great, right? Those westbound University Drive just opened up. Everybody's flowing in there, right? Look, this is the northbound. There's cars back half a mile in the left turn lane northbound trying to get into this mall, right? Um, you're never going to run out of cars <laughs> trying to turn. It's got dual left and it ended, right? It's only like a 15 second. It's really too short. Now, southbound through is supposed to be going, oh, there's still people in the intersection. Yeah, it happens every time. And here's the end of that phase one, we call it. 13 cars got through. And here comes one more car. They're backed up almost to the sign on that S-curve. And that's the end of Q right there, right? These guys are going to buzz along. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. I'm going to jump ahead. And there's not much. We have lots of green time for these through movements. Look at all those left turn people. All those left turn people. You wait in that line like 20 minutes to get through. So these people are mad. When they get up here to turn left, they are mad. And you are not going to, you know, yellow lights mean nothing to them at that point. <laughs> all right. Yeah, they're going to go, it don't matter well, what's going on. And here's this, still the back of this queue. And the reason is that three-way stop is blocking. Everybody wants to turn left. Everyone wants to, go, wants to go to the food court. No one's in the right lane. They're all in that left lane on the entrance. They're all trying to turn left to go to Barnes & Noble in the food court. And it is just blocking things up. And and, the F, and uh, that queue is going all the way back. See, here we still got the end of queue. And we start, we start the westbound through. Phase eight, there it goes. Zoom, if you're on university, great. You can get in here pretty fast. If you're on grape, you are screwed, all right? Look at all those cars getting in. Lots of capacity because that queue is back up here halfway down. And so you got two lanes wide, although most people are in the left lane. All right, we got 11 vehicles puked in there. All right after that gets choked up with those cars going straight westbound. Now we get the northbound left. And bam, look, they're stopped, they're stopped, they're stopped. Here comes the back of the queue. The back of the queue is right there. Green light, can't get through. All right, 13 cars tried going, 10 of them were legal. 
<laughs> before the light turned. Oh, he's still blocking that lane. Oh, now he's finally moving because someone finally went in the right lane. They don't want to be in the right lane. They want to be in the left lane. Like that's Those guys aren't giving up. He's staying in that left lane. Screw you guys. I'm going to go to the food court. All right. Um, so that's, uh, this is right before Christmas, a few years ago. It's like that still. Uh, every Saturday afternoon, it's still like this. This thing is backed up. It is just a mess. All right, for that. All right, let's let's um, let's cancel that guy. Get him out of the way. All right, so that's, you know, they're backed up, consistently back up into here, right on that, and each time. And I don't know, but Maul will probably be mad if they found out I was playing this video all the time. But I still like this video. <laughs> I still like it a little still works for me right for that so that's this that's this poor design if this was a free-flowing uh entrance and they didn't have to wait for these people it would be better having all those pedestrian crossings right in here is still bad it'd be even better if you brought this traffic around and went around the outside of the of the parking area and then if you wanted to park you come up here and get rid of the circulatory road up next to the mall now that's kind of controversial people have been trying it uh newer designs have been trying to get rid of that uh, for one thing, it's dangerous, right? Because you have to, everyone who parks has to walk across the road to get into the mall. Um, and so that sometimes they've, uh, different people have tried to restrict that. And the idea is you want uh, the pedestrians near the building. You don't want circulatory, circulating vehicles near it. So you bring them to the outside. There's a beautiful road out here, right? And you can come up and you could go through the parking lot just fine, but just don't have this be the main circulatory road right in front of the, of the mall. And you'd probably have to put islands across every now and then to make people come back around and so forth. What's there, you know, people trying to look for parking are gonna be mad about it. Okay, but this, this road runs all the way around the mall, so just follow that whole thing around. So that's, um, that's parking, that's entrances, that's flow in the parking lot area. So think about that. Next time you go shopping, should we ever get out of our house again? And you get to go to a store, <laughs> look at the look at the how it's set up in the parking. And uh, currently, except at grocery stores, I think, and occasional drive-through lines, there is no real traffic problem with any of these right now. It's small is probably having no trouble at all at the moment uh, with traffic. But uh, assuming we return to normal, uh, next time you're in a shopping area, check it out. Uh, check it out. And even when there's no cars there, look at how people are designing these entrances and think about if they put this much wiggle and all that in there, they must be expecting a lot of cars, right, for that, especially like that new Meyer entrance over in Valpo. So uh, that's the lesson for today, and we will talk to you next time.